So here to take your questions today are Augustine Carstens, General Manager of the BIS, Claudio Borio, Head of the Monetary and Economic Department, and Hyun Song Shin, Economic Advisor and Head of Research. I hand over now to Augustine to make some opening remarks. Augustine. Thank you very much, Jill, and welcome all of you. And thank you for your interest in this year's annual economic report. Let me start by saying that the global economy is at a critical juncture. For the first time in decades, we face a combination of high inflation and financial stability issues or financial fault lines. There is a sense of hope that we can achieve a soft, or I would say softish landing, uh, but we must be ready to tackle the risks. One risk uh, which we outline in the report is that high inflation could persist. New price pressures could emerge. In many countries, households' purchasing power has fallen, as wages have not kept pace with inflation. With tight job markets, workers may seek to redress the balance. Firms have found it easier to raise prices and may pass higher costs on to consumers. Once this vicious cycle sets in, it's very hard to, to stop it. Risks to financial stability also loom. Debt and asset prices are higher than in past periods of interest rate hikes. Buffers are running out in the form of pandemic era savings and longer long terms. This means growth could slow more than currently expected. The resulting financial strains will likely come through credit losses. Weak banks risk losing their footing. Historically, banking stress often goes in tandem with higher interest rates. High debt, high asset prices, and high inflation add to the risks. Although banks are stronger than before, pockets of vulnerability remain, especially where rules to make banks stronger were not applied uh, fully. Uh, even relatively small institutions can trigger systemic collapses in confidence, as we saw recently. Shaky government finances could, could also cloud the future. Against this backdrop, central bank's task is clear. The key challenge is fully taming inflation, and the last mile is typically the hardest. Central banks are committed to staying the course to restore price stability and protect people's purchasing power. To give central banks more room to fight inflation, prudential policy must kick in to ensure the safety and stability of financial institutions and the financial system. Where there are gaps, new regulations may be required. Tight macroprudential policies can limit the strains higher rates place on banks, and stiffer supervision could remedy some of the faults that came to light in recent bank failures. It's important to implement Basel III in full without delay. Fiscal policy must, must also consolidate. This too would help in the fight against inflation and bolster financial resiliency, and it would provide badly needed buffers that could be deployed against future downturns. Above all, policy needs to take a longer term view. Monetary and fiscal policies have carried too much of the burden of sustaining economic growth. As a result, they have severely tested the limits of what we call the region of stability, a concept we explain in chapter two. That's the mix of monetary and fiscal policy that fosters enduring economic and financial stability and diffuses the tensions between them. Overstepping these boundaries can trigger high inflation, economic slumps and banking, currency or sovereign prices. Policy makers must be realistic about what they can achieve. High inflation and financial instability are the results of a long journey. There have been an overly ambitious view of monetary policy's ability to hit a small inflation target and a more general belief that macroeconomic policy could support growth indefinitely without stocking inflation. Now mindsets need to change. They must recognize the shortcomings of repeated emergency action, which stimulates output in downturns but fails to rebuild buffers when growth resumes. To drive long-term economic prosperity, 
Government, governments need to reinvigorate long neglected structural reforms. There really are no shortcuts. The inflationary outbreak reinforced the imperative for central banks to preserve the public's trust in money. An essential part of this is to provide a form of money that keeps pace with technology and the needs of society. Expanding on our work in previous annual economic reports, in Chapter 3, we built out our blueprint for the future financial system. Our vision is for a system that improves on the parts of the financial system that work well today and will enable entirely new financial products in the future. So these are our main messages. Yeah, definitely, let me reiterate uh, the fact that we believe that uh, the fight against infl inflation is still a, a center, center, the centerpiece of attention for central banks. It's more difficult than in previous years because now we have seen some fault lines in the in the financial system. Uh, that makes the going forward more 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 difficult. Uh, inflation has come down up to to an extent, but there are still resistance in core inflation, and therefore central banks need to redouble uh, their attention towards this. Uh, and uh, and uh, in, in when precisely this this uh, complexities arise is of the essence that other policies also pitch in in this uh, priority. As we mentioned, high inflation will not help real, real, real wages, will definitely not help uh, economic growth, will definitely not uh, promote financial stability. Therefore, it's of the essence to bring inflation down as fast and as smooth as possible. So with this, I stop, and uh, now we're more than happy to entertain your questions. Thank you very much, Augustine. So we now open to questions. You can raise your hand and ask your question or put your question in the chat. So we'll just pause while we uh, wait for raised hands or questions. So I see a raised hand from Marcus Zidra from Süddeutsche Zeitung. Marcus. Hello. Thanks a lot. Hello. Um, I, w I wonder whether you could elaborate again on the question why inflation is so m much more difficult to tackle nowadays than in former inflation periods, please. Thank you. Well, uh, yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I mean, uh, as, as we mentioned uh, in our last annual economic report, uh, uh, inflation, uh, when it started increasing in 2020-21, had two key parts. Uh, one, uh, that some of the increases were related to transitory factors, like commodity prices, energy prices, the distortion of uh, uh, production value chains, uh, aspects that didn't, did not necessarily have to do with the traditional sources of inflation, and that could uh, easily be reverted, as it turned out to be the case. Therefore, uh, when we look into headline inflation, I would say the progress that we have seen is mostly in, in, in the inflation that was created by these factors. Uh, there was also the recognition that uh, an important part of the increase in inflation had to do with the stimulative, uh, eff the, with the effects of the stimulative impulse that was given at, at the time of the pandemic and with the Russia-Ukrainian war uh, through fiscal and monetary policy. Uh, and this was combined also, I would say, with the more, uh, uh, more difficulty in aggregate supply to respond to the impulses of aggregate demand. Uh, and this is precisely where the, the, the main difficulty that we are facing. Uh, which basically is how to bring down core inflation. Uh, I think that uh, an important uh, aspect that we identify in our analysis is that uh, services prices are uh, uh, the, the, the more, most sticky. Many of them are still increasing. At the same time, we have seen an important decrease in real wages in many countries, and therefore, uh, this with the combination of the fact that in most cases labor markets are still uh, uh, 
are, are, I mean, are, are relatively hot and unemployment is low. Uh, it is uh, not, uh, 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 it's very difficult to discard a, a scenario where wages start increasing more or the demands for wage increases by, by labor uh, are higher than inflation or tend to be higher than inflation. So this can uh, fit into inflation and therefore either we can see a rebound of inflation or a more difficult time in bringing inflation down. Therefore, we perceive that central banks need to be very, very vigilant about this process because precisely when you enter into wage price uh, process, uh, it's relatively easy to transit from a low inflation environment into a higher inflation environment. Uh, so we have to really guard against that. Uh, central banks have done a lot. Uh, they have increased interest rates substantially. Uh, we also have to recognize that the actions of monetary policy in inflation happen with the lag, so that lag is still to come. Uh, therefore, we probably haven't seen the full impact of monetary pol policy actions on inflation. Uh, but even, even recognizing this, it, it would behoove central banks to be very vigilant and, uh, uh, and uh, being ready to act, uh, further tighten monetary policy in, in case that is necessary. Thank you very much, Augustine. The next raised hand is from Aline Bronzati from Agencia Estado. Hi, good morning. Thank you for having me. Uh, emerging markets started earlier the tightening of monetary policy. What's your outlook for these countries? The current inflation levels should support a loosening cycle ahead. If you can say something specific about Brazil, I appreciate that. And I have one more question about the fiscal policy. We'll have a new fiscal framework in Brazil. What's your view about that? And which challenges do you see in the Brazilian economy and conse consequently to central bank? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Elina. I am... Well, uh, as we report in, in uh, as we uh, establish in our report, we feel that the emerging markets have fared quite well uh, through this uh, uh, cycle. I mean, traditionally, when uh, the world economy uh, was were, was facing a process of increasing interest rates, especially in advanced economies emerging markets tended to tended to to suffer uh, there was the increase in interest rates ten, tended to to generate a lot of uh, portfolio uh, reallocations uh, uh, capital outflows a lot of volatility in the exchange rate probably some uh, some banking issues and therefore uh, uh, usually we ended up with the with a very difficult macro scenario. But uh, I think that uh, many emerging bar markets, the vast majority of them, uh, have internalized this, this type of processes. Uh, I think they have been preparing themselves for this type of external uh, volatility. Uh, most of them have a relatively small uh, current account deficit. Many of them have strengthened their monetary uh, policy frameworks. They have accumulated more international reserves. They have a stronger banking system. Therefore, uh, 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 what we have seen is that many of them were relatively agile to respond uh, to by increasing their own domestic interest rates in a preemptive way. Certainly, Brazil was one of the countries that did so as well as Mexico and others. And uh, I think this uh, has facilitated a lot the adjustment process because uh, the otherwise uh, present uh, depreciation of the domestic currency did not materialize and that reduced the pressures on inflation. 
So as, as is the case in Brazil, we already see a very, very noticeable decrease in inflation. Uh, I think that in a way, uh, uh, the process of disinflation is be being led by these countries. Uh, again, I, I would say that it's too early to, to say that the uh, uh, monetary policy should be uh, loosened. I think that we, we I think that uh, we need to be absolutely sure that the process is going on in an appropriate way. So, so far, so good, I would say. Uh, as as you, you know, I was in Brazil a, a few weeks ago. I had a very good visit, a visit with the Central Bank, with the Ministry of Finance. Uh, I, I came out uh, encouraged by the fact that uh, uh, there is a the po monetary policy and fiscal policy in Brazil tend to be working in, a, in the same direction. I think the fiscal pa package that is being considered is a powerful one, uh, and I think it should uh, coordinate or, or should work together with monetary policy to bring together a, a better macro scenario with lower inflation, more fiscal a, a sustainability and a more opportunities for growth. So I'm encouraged of what I saw in Brazil in the recent weeks. Thank you very much, Augustine. And the next question is from Jana Rando of Bloomberg, please. Ah, Jana, I think we have somehow seen you drop off the call. Oh, you've joined back. Oh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Perfect. Um, thank you so much. Um, yes, I have a question, and I'm wondering um, whether you can talk a little bit about the lessons uh, central banks uh, should take away from crisis fighting, really ever since the great financial crisis. And I'm thinking low, sometimes negative interest rates, uh, large quantitative easing, policy coordination. What do they need to do better next time around? Thanks very much, Jana. Augustine? Well, uh, let me start and then I'll give the floor to Claudio Borio and my colleague for him to elaborate uh, further. Uh, I mean, I think that the, after the global financial crisis, uh, we entered a process where for different reasons, uh, stimuli to aggregate demand uh, was met relatively seamlessly uh, by aggregate uh, supply and that, uh, therefore, the, a very proactive monetary policy did not generate an increase in inflation. As you are very well aware, the uh, last decade was characterized by central banks trying to bring, in particular in advanced economies, trying to bring inflation back to the 2% level, coming from below. And that was quite uh, un unusual. Uh, but the conditions that that in a way uh, allowed for a very proactive monetary policy to, 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 to work without much inflation, uh, it's over. And uh, we have documented this very clearly after the COVID-19 process and the, and, and the geopolitical events uh, have made far more difficult uh, the, to, to have an impact on economic activity without affecting inflation. And this, this, uh, this goes both for fiscal and monetary policy. I think that we need to rethink as we move forward that if we want sustainable growth without inflation, uh, more attention should be paid to, to, to uh, policies that address the process of economic growth in a more direct way, higher productivity, uh, uh, more global, uh, uh, to, to limit the, the deglobalization, uh, uh, basically enhance, uh, uh, enhance education. Uh, those reforms that address the, 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 the growth potential of an economy. Uh, what we see today is that both fiscal and monetary policies uh, have depleted, I would say, their capacity to stimulate aggregate demand in a healthy way. Uh, as a matter of fact, monetary policy 
needs to concentrate in the years to come in uh, limiting uh, inflation and reducing inflation. Uh, no question uh, about the possibility of uh, helping economic growth. And uh, fiscal policy, well, of course, we're facing a situation with very, very high debt to GDP ratios and therefore, I think it would be called for, for some fiscal consolidation. Therefore, uh, as we say, a change in mindset need to happen. A growth need to depend less on fiscal and monetary policy. It should depend more on structural policies. And I would say th those are the, the, key, the key issues. The manifestation of uh, having used uh, to the limit fiscal and monetary policies, precisely what we are seeing, which is high inflation and bouts of financial instability. And therefore, this cannot keep on going like this. Therefore, a, an important re rethink about the, the, the mix of economic policies is of the essence. But now, let me give the floor to Claudio for him to complement. Thank you. Uh, well, Agustin provided the 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 big picture which i think it's essential it's the is the idea that uh, monitoring fiscal policy need to focus on on the long term not just uh, to respond to the immediate needs of the economy because things that may appear uh, reasonable and indeed compelling in the short run may over time generate uh, problems for the economy and this longer term horizon is is uh, is of the essence um on just to a, a couple of small points to elaborate on what uh, Agustin said. Um, first, the uh, what happened post GFC, and uh, one of the uh, issues that I think will um, will provide uh, material for reflection going forward is what Agustin mentioned earlier. That is the, the the idea that it is rather it's simple or. It is realistic for, for monetary policy to try and hit targets very, very precisely. Um, and in particular, what we saw before the, the, uh, the COVID crisis, the, the idea that you could um, relatively smoothly try to get to the 2% number from a few, percent, a few decimal points below. Um, the, the point there is that, as we argued in the annual economic report the previous year, um, the, the properties of inflation, when inflation is uh, evolving at low levels, uh, what do we call a low inflation regime, are rather different from those uh, at a high inflation regime. And in particular, they are rather uh, significant self-stabilizing forces, whereby um, changes in uh, what we measure as inflation is to a considerable extent the, the result of changes in idiosyncratic, in, in individual prices that over time tend to cancel e each other out. And the link between wages and prices is, is quite uh, limited for a number of reasons. But given that that is the case, uh, there is greater room for monetary policy to accept uh, moderate, even if persistent, uh, deviations of inflation from point target, in particular shortfalls of inflation from, from point target. And to the extent that that is the case, that allows, uh, that limits the need for very low interest rates for very long, very large balance sheets for, uh, for protracted periods, and therefore provides monetary policy with an additional degree uh, of freedom in its performance, which can also help uh, uh, take into account more systematically the long-term implications for, for, financial, for financial stability. On, monitoring fiscal, uh, on the crisis management per se, uh, as we elaborate in the annual economic report, if financial strain is, uh, is limited, then monetary policy can do this on its own. If it is more, uh, it's, if it's more acute, then as we saw in 2020 and as we saw in 2008, monetary policy needs the support also of fiscal policy because monetary policy can provide liquidity but not solvency backup. And that means that it's all the more important for fiscal policy to retain room for policy maneuver, to have some safety margins. Hence, the uh, and yet another reason why it is very important in the long term to consolidate fiscal positions. Thank you very much. So I see a couple of raised hands. So the next question goes to Tuledo Zuane from um, Business Day, please.
Hello. Hello. How are you? Very well, thank you. Uh, my question is about uh, emerging markets, but also specifically South Africa. What policy recommendations would you give to a country like South Africa that uh, even though we have increased interest rates, um, accelerated interest rates in order to, to, to curb inflation, we've seen inflation uh, stay above the upper bracket of our central bank. And at the same time, we've also seen our currency depreciate to you know very high levels, uh, especially following consistent increases by 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 the Fed uh, increasing the interest rates. So, what policy recommendations or advice would you give uh, South Africa in this in this light? So, let me come in maybe just first to say that we don't specifically comment on particular countries. Let's answer in the uh, probably the broadest terms, uh, mm -hmm. and maybe not give particular prescriptions for particular countries. Augustine, over to you. Well, I, I think in the case uh, of some emerging markets, and in particular in South Africa, uh, there is a, there are, there are a, a different uh, aspects of complexity that are present. I mean, uh, and, and in a way, this goes also in line with our main message, a uh, uh, broad message in, in Chapter 1 and Chapter 2 in our annual economic uh, report. And that is the fact that, yes, the traditional uh, macro stability policies are very important, but also structural policies are very, very important. And I would say in the case of South, South Africa, both are important. Uh, in terms of uh, traditional macro stabilization, uh, needless to say, the, the, the attention that the central bank needs, I mean, the central bank needs to be fully, fully uh, uh, concentrated in fighting inflation, they need to react as they have been doing it. So in that sense, it's appropriate. A uh, fiscal consolidation is also very important. Uh, we need to consider that uh, that uh, both policies are uh, quite uh, related, and therefore, uh, uh, when you are facing a, a process of uh, instability. Uh, the coordinating action is of the essence. And so that would be one broad line that, uh, that we would uh, certainly recommend. And the other is, is also, uh, in particular, uh, with inflation, there are some particular structural issues that are important to take care of. Uh, I mean, electricity issues are very important. The supply of commodities, uh, foodstuffs is also very important. And many of these factors cannot be directly controlled by monetary policy, and therefore a, a more comprehensive uh, a policy package is, is needed. Uh, so I think that's what I, at this stage I could say uh, with respect to the case of uh, South Africa, but this also applies to many other emerging markets. Thank you very much, Augustine. And the next hand I see raised is Martin. So, assumably, assuming it's Martin Arnold from the Financial Times. Martin. Austin Arnold, yes. Yes, great. Thank you can you. hear me. Good. Yeah, good. perfectly. Go ahead. Yeah, so I my question is not on the annual report, but it's on the issue of Russian central bank assets and the EU's discussions about whether they could mobilize Russia's central bank assets that have been frozen or the proceeds from them to fund the reconstruction of Ukraine. Now, does the BIS have a view on that? Because it'd be interesting to know whether that would breach BIS rules, for instance. Well, I mean, uh, uh, for us, it's very difficult to to comment on these processes. Uh, uh, I would say at this point we don't have a, we don't have a comment. It's a very specific question. Uh, it's work in progress. Uh, you know, at this stage, I I, I rather uh, don't uh, give a, a additional commentary because I I, I I'm not on on. Uh, firm grounding. <laughs> Thanks very much. So, um, okay, we go to the next question. Uh, so, I see 
Paul Davies uh, from Bloomberg. Paul. Um, uh, a couple of things. I guess, the, so the first one is on, you know, higher interest rates uh, obviously are hitting collateral values um, uh, across uh, markets. And I'm wondering how much we need to be concerned about uh, the impact of on this of this on you know shrinking repo financing or just greater kind of encumbrance of collateral. I think this is something that played a role in uh, in the collapse of Credit Suisse alongside the classic deposit run. You know, is it something that we ought to be worried about or we need to think about for financial stability more broadly after such a long period of, of uh, you know very very low rates and you know collateral value growth and so on and so forth? Is that is that uh, an area of concern for you guys? Okay. Agostino, uh, let yeah. me let me give you a, a reaction, and then I probably ask a Hyun Shin to 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 elaborate. I mean, certainly we 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 have this in our radar screen when you are where you are in a process of tightening. Certainly, a part of the <laughs> of the transmission mechanism is how that tightening affects the value of different assets. And well, of course, when interest rates are increasing, if some financial assets, and in particular, many that are used as collateral, will uh, uh, observe some uh, reduction in value. Uh, in many of these markets, they operate based on haircuts, and in a way, those haircuts try to anticipate uh, this type of, uh, of volatility in, a, in, in the value of collateral. Uh, uh, so, I mean, I would say that by and large, by and large, we have seen that the markets are performing relatively well, but nevertheless, we would be remiss to, to, to say, to ignore, I would say that we have seen some bouts of market volatility, uh, some related to very specific issues. Uh, like, for example, the case in the UK in September of last year, or uh, recently in in in, in March uh, with in, in in the US. So, I think that we need to be very very vigilant. Uh, in particular, uh, we need to to we are trying to have as good as a view of what is going in among uh, non-bank financial intermediation. Uh, there is where we don't have uh, a lot of visibility, uh, what uh, some different intermediaries are doing, uh, where there might be a, a hidden uh, leverage uh, and the uh, uh, liquidity mismatches. And usually those type of, of uh, when you have really a lot of leverage and many of these leverage depending on collateral, uh, what you're pointing pointing out is really, really of the essence. So yes, we are trying to, 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 to get a clearer view. The Financial Stability Board is doing the same. Uh, so uh, yes, I, I mean, I think that we need to be, uh, to have our antennas up and try to have an early detection if in, in these problems. What, what has happened is when this becomes critical, uh, central banks have needed to use their instruments and act uh, oftentimes as market makers of last resort, in particular in critical markets like uh, government securities markets. Uh, so yes, I mean it's it's it's, it's squarely in uh, in in the in the area of interest and priority of central banks to keep these markets uh, running uh, smoothly. But uh, let me now offer uh, the floor to Hyun for him to elaborate. Yes, thank you, Paul. Um, let me just add that uh, clearly uh, interest rate risk on the banking book um, is an important element here. We saw that in uh, the case of Silicon Valley Bank. Um, you're also raising a very important point about um, risk appetite as um, manifested in spreads and haircuts and so on. I, I think the point about uh, collateral that Augustin raised is very important because um, the margins are, if you like, the mirror image of, of leverage. Um, and the leverage is also a, a good you know, weather vane for, um, for risk taking. 
Um, what we've seen, though, so far is that um, the, the usual association uh, between higher rates and less risk-taking, um, I mean, that has appeared less than uh, what we may have expected, uh, given past evidence. Uh, we haven't seen the same kind of deleveraging uh, you know, more broad deleveraging through the risk-taking channel as uh, as we may have expected. And you, you, know, you, uh, you know also that uh, if you look at uh, measures of implied volatility, those are pretty low. So uh, the fix, for example, in the equity market is, is pretty low. But um, it's, I think, very important for us to stay vigilant, exactly um, as Augustin said, precisely because these things can um, can flare up uh, with very little warning. And um, I think one important element also from a macro angle is what's happening to the exchange rate, because uh, typically when there is a, re, uh, a recoiling from risk and, a, um, and uh, the deleveraging impulse, we see uh, very big currency moves as well. And uh, in particular, stronger dollar tends to go hand in hand with, um, with less risk taking. Uh, and that was very much in evidence last year. Um, this year, there's also been a slight strengthening of the dollar, but uh, there's nowhere near been the same type of you know recoiling. So um, it, it, it's less um, apparent um, so far, but clearly uh, uh, there's no room for complacency. Thank you very much, Hyun. So I see one more hand raised at the moment, so I will call on that person shortly, but just a reminder that you can ask, I think another hand gone up. Um, it might be an old hand, and also if there's any questions that Andrew wants to put into the chat. So the next hand raised I see is Bastian Benrath from Bloomberg. Bastian? I would like to touch on something you said earlier, Augustine, which is that the labor markets are hot everywhere and unemployment is low. Um, how much of this do you think is also due to a demographic change in advanced economies, uh, to limit my question to that? Uh, and like maybe elaborating from that, also the question, uh, do you expect that at some point for advanced economies, immigration will become you know, a resource, a good, something you want to have, whereas now, obviously, a lot of advanced economies more seek to limit uh, immigration. If you could uh, elaborate on that, that'd be nice. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Bastian. So just turning to um, Augustine. Yes. Um, well, needless to say that there are many structural issues in the labor market that are playing a role. Uh, I definitely coincide with you that demographic in advanced economy is an issue. And certainly uh, immigration uh, could provide a, a solution, or at least partial solution to it. Uh, but we also have seen other developments in the labor market that are more associated to relatively recent events. I think that uh, uh, some, something that is playing still a very important role is the fact that, that the uh, the distortions uh, that were generated in the labor market uh, in, in service intensive sectors or labor intensive sectors like uh, tourism, uh, airlines and other uh, public facing activities uh, have, uh, have a very difficult time recovering. I mean, we still see in many countries, including in, in, in Switzerland or in Germany, where some restaurants are, have not reopened because they don't find people. And that, that has to do more with uh, the distortions and the reactions that were generated by COVID-19, by, by, the, by the way that the pandemic was uh, fought. Uh, and, and therefore, there are still I would say, uh, even though we have seen uh, very high increases in wages, uh, uh, still we don't see in many in many of these activities uh, employment to get back to the levels that existed pre-COVID-19. So, yes, uh, uh, something that we are uh, trying very very hard is to try to understand 
to try to understand uh, what is going on in the, la in the labor markets, uh, uh, particularly in services. There is also a very important question that is out there, which is uh, why productivity has decreased or has not increased. I mean, because as, as I mentioned, uh, what we have seen is that economic activity is, st is still strong and employment is also strong. So the way those two can coexist is by having lower productivity. And the question is why productivity has been decreasing. So I think, I think there are questions. Uh, uh, labor markets is something that we will have to concentrate trying to understand better. Also central banks, and I think that they, a lot of their response in the future will depend on how labor markets evolve. Thank you very much, Augustine. I see two hands raised from others that have already asked a question, so just want to check if there's any new hands. If not, then Paul Davies has a second question from Bloomberg again. Paul, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, so uh, there's, in the in the intro, there's a sort of a you identify a bit of a cycle where where you're talking about kind of debt fueled growth, and I guess if we think about private debt fueled growth and then moments of crisis and the extension of um, yeah safety nets, financial safety nets after that, and then you know uh, uh, what what that does to sort of sovereign credit worthiness, sovereign indebtedness, uh, and then I guess we get back into another sort of private debt expansion and so on. We've we've had several of these cycles. I'm just wondering. I mean, you talked a bit before about you know structural changes to help growth, but I mean, but how how do we escape this kind of cycle of private debt extension of safety nets, you know, more sovereign debt, more private debt extension of safety nets, without going through a you know a much bigger crisis? I guess is the question. How how can we escape that cycle? I mean, again, uh, we we manage this con 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 concept of uh, the region of stability, and the region of stability precisely uh, tries to provide some guidance for fiscal and monetary policy to prevent them re reaching situations where. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the sustainability of, uh, so of, of, of public finances is tested. I mean, I think it's a matter of anticipating what are the fiscal pressures that will come into the future. Uh, today, we know that, uh, for example, through pension funds, through health systems, and so on and so forth, there will be some pressures on public finance. Uh, also, many of the of the fiscal uh, measures that were undertaken during the last two or three years, many of them have, 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 are still present, even though uh, the, immediate, uh, the immediate reason uh, for those measures to exist have sort of passed. There is also this belief that high inflation could be exploitable from, from the point of view of fiscal sustainability with, because with higher inflation, debt to GDP tends to reduce, but that, that is, that is uh, more than anything a, 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 an illusion, you know. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, inflation will be brought under control, uh, but nominal rates will be much higher, and therefore uh, 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 the, the, the debt services will be much higher. Therefore, I think, I think that uh, there needs to be, I would say, a far more prudent management of fiscal policy as we go, as we go into the future. And then there is also uh, the issue of uh, how, for how long uh, can a, 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 an environment of very low interest rates be preserved as happened during the last, uh, last decade. I mean, the question is, should central bank try to hit uh, the, the inflation target, uh, even if it's uh, uh, for so, quite some time below the target? Uh, I think that there are some trade-offs that need to be considered, and uh, we need to reflect on that. Um, I don't know, Claudio, if you want to elaborate further on this. And not much, really. Just a couple of points. Um, what we do in the annual economic report is to provide 
an analysis of uh, the nature of the problem and suggest some possible solutions. Um, of course, uh, and one of those, uh, the aspects that we think needs to, to change is mindset. Um, in order to, first of all, recognize th that uh, there are these limits to demand management policies, that there are these limits to what monetary and fiscal policy can do in order to, to generate growth. Um, without that, I think that it would be difficult to, to have the necessary changes in policy that could uh, bring about uh, a smoother glide into, back into the region, uh, region of stability. At the end of the day, it will be a matter of the political will. The, the relevant authorities would need to share the analysis, which they may or may not. And once they do share the analysis, they would need to have the determination and I would say the political courage to carry the, to implement the necessary changes. Thank you much, very much, Claudio. I see another raised hand um, from Alina Bronzati of Agencia Estado. Just wondering if it's a an old hand or a new hand. Thanks for having me again. I have a little uh, short uh, a short question about the, the artificial intelligence. Uh, how do you view about that? What the impact do you do you see? in the market, you know, there are some banks in the U.S., in Brazil, uh, using, using this technology to read the, the, the central bank communications and to anticipate uh, movements in the interest rates. Um, what's your view? Thank you. Thank you very much. I see Hyun, I think, willing to take this question, but Augustine, do you want to as well? Hyun, please. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Alina. Um, of course, um, you know, AI has really come to the fore, um, in particular from the end of last year into this year, and, um, you know, it's become very much a, a talking point. I, I think the big, um, uh, you know, shift in emphasis has been these large language models, this generative AI, as it were, which, uh, you know, relies on, um, you know, very large um, bodies of text and uh, finding patterns that actually, you know, um, um, reveal new, um, uh, if you like, uh, emergent properties that actually come from that. What, um, what the central bank community has been doing uh, has been using some of the same pattern recognition capabilities for uh, applications in um, so-called soup tech. Uh, using using AI and machine learning techniques to detect patterns for supervisory purposes, the uh, BIS Innovation Hub has been um, has been what, uh, you know one of the leaders in in engaging uh, you know those techniques for for soup tech purposes. So I think the the technology, I mean, I, it's uh, it's something that uh, others are, are probably better to the uh, better place to comment on. But certainly, from the point of view of the reception given by the financial markets, there is a lot, you know there is a lot of um, uh, you know revealed uh, you know enthusiasm for the for the techniques and the and the implications for uh, the shift in value you know um, and value generation. Um, there are also you know big issues about the future of the labour market. Um, you know what kinds of sectors will be affected and how much. Those are still, I would say. Um, uh, a very early st a stage of speculation, but um, uh, clearly this is something that uh, everyone will need to watch very carefully, uh, you know, both from a purely technical point of view, but also from the point of view of the big macro questions. And not, and not least, um, um, to the extent that these uh, techniques become very well embedded in our daily lives, uh, that will ha clearly have very uh, important implications for um, uh, the guardrails that might have to be put uh, in case they're not uh, uh, being used in, in a way that's conducive for the public interest. And I think this is why the, the topic of regulation has also come to the fore. So I think we need to keep track of all of these uh, different strands of the discussion. Let me just elaborate one point. As, as Hyun said, we have been... Uh, devoting a lot of resources in our innovation hub to 
follow-up was having with AI. Uh, Hyun mentioned it on supervision regulation. Uh, I recently gave a speech and wrote uh, an op-ed uh, about uh, the need for supervision to evolve. Uh, I think supervisory agencies need to have more resources uh, and more resources to, ver to use much better technology. I think that as uh, financial intermediaries use more artificial intelligence, uh, regulators will need to be able to supervise also how artificial intelligence is being applied. And that definitely requires expertise, resources, and so on. So I think that part is very important. We also have been developing some, some processes here to be able to, to, to use artificial intelligence to supervise and to, 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 to have much better market surveillance, in particular when these markets are evolving so fast. So I think that, that yes, we need to be mindful about uh, how artificial intelligence is affecting markets, but also we need to be uh, uh, up to speed in using artificial intelligence to make our uh, own work far more efficient and up to speed to what markets are uh, demanding. Thank you very much, Augustine. And that was the last question. I don't see any other hands raised or questions in the inbox. So just to say thank you very much. And a reminder that the embargo lifts uh, along with the annual report on Sunday, the 25th of June at 11 a.m. Central European Summer Time. And also a reminder that the presentations on the annual economic report um, will be broadcast live on Sunday on BIS.org. So thank you very much for joining us today and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Take care.